You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. The work of the angels in the life of the believer. Hello and welcome to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphian Video. The work of the angels is a very personal issue for each believer. The angels, as servants of God, are entrusted by him to care for those who love and who fear him and to bring them to his future kingdom. Though life is not always easy, a believer will be guided by an angel. When a believer's life is devoted to the glory of God and an eternal future, we will finally rejoice with those who have cared for us. There are some subjects that are quite academic, aren't there? If we think of something like the uh, nature of the Godhead, uh, is God a trinity or is God uh, dwelling alone? Then subjects like that help us to understand the truth and help us to understand the God that we worship. But there is a sense that they're a little bit detached from us, aren't they? because they're to do with God. But the work of the angels is something that is deeply personal to us. These glorious beings who who are close to God, who dwell in God's presence, God has given a role to look after and be with those that love him. I find that a very awesome thought, using awesome in the traditional sense of the word, to think that Almighty God has a regard for those that will be his and sets about in his plan and purpose angels that will be close to them. So we're going to divide the the evening into some unequal parts. First of all, we're going to think about some principles of the angels and some principles about how we should live our lives in response to the fact that that these angels are close by us. In some ways, I don't need to speak because the the hymn that uh, Brother David chose um, beautifully sums up, really, our responsibility uh, in these things. We're going to look at a number of different examples in the New Testament and the Old Testament, and then we're going to finish by thinking about what happens when things go wrong, humanly speaking. There's lots of examples, aren't there, in the Scriptures of of those that are saved by the angels. This is God's purpose, has has decreed that that they would be saved, and maybe we think of King David, and we'll think of him uh, in our talk. But there are also people like Stephen, who was martyred for his beliefs. And we could say, well, where were the angels there? Were they having a day off? And the answer is, of course not. But as we shall see, the angels are there to further God's purpose. And that's what our lives should be. Our lives are in service to the Almighty God. And sometimes his purpose coincides with things that are beneficial to us. And sometimes God's purpose coincides with things that naturally or humanly speaking are not beneficial to us. But we as believers, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, have to align ourselves to the will of God. So that if we are truly close to him, it will matter not whether good things or bad things happen to us. If we are doing the right thing in the eyes of God, then we can take comfort that God will always be with us through good things, humanly speaking, and bad things, humanly speaking. Because God's purpose is not the here and now. God's purpose is eternity. 
and he's invited us to share eternity with him. And we must never, ever lose sight of that great hope. So let's go back, first of all, into the Old Testament. And we want to start in Exodus, uh, and Exodus chapter 23. Because I think in Exodus, where the children of Israel are coming out of the, uh, of the land of Egypt, there are a number of principles regarding the angels in reference to the believers. Here was a nation that was going to be God's people. And in Exodus chapter 23, God speaks to the nation, and in verse 20 he says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. So this was the purpose of the angel in the wilderness, and I would say to you that the purpose is unchanged now. The angels are sent by God to keep us in the way. And we can see that in two ways, can't we? Keeping. Keeping us in the way is sometimes the, the staff of of putting barriers in our path that we might think, am I going the right way? And it is also the idea of being kept, looked after in the way. We see both of those things, don't we, with the children of Israel. Sometimes God is there providing for them, and sometimes God is there testing them. But it wasn't just about the way, was it, brethren and sisters? It wasn't about the here and now. No, it's I will keep you in the way and to bring thee into the place that I have prepared. I'll put it, that's the more important part of the equation. God's purpose with the nation of Israel was to bring them into the promised land, a land which he'd promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And God's purpose with us is to bring us into the promised land, to be inheritors of that promise of, to Abraham, to be joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is the role of the angels, to look after those that are his, to bring them to that place of salvation. And sometimes... We might find the, the rod of affliction to help us back into the way. So just because the angels are with us doesn't mean our lives are, are full of ease and never having to worry about anything. Quite the contrary, sometimes. So I want to just think about this angel um, for a few moments. Before we, uh, we, we go back to the earlier part of Exodus, let's just stop off in Exodus chapter 19. Because that, that purpose of God is amplified in verse 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall ye be a peculiar or a precious treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So this purpose of being brought to this land isn't just that we should go and have a lovely time in the land of Israel. That purpose of Israel in the wilderness and the purpose of God now is to bring about a people who will be a nation of priests. And the role of the priest is to bring the people to God. And that will be our role in the kingdom age to bring the world's population to an understanding of the things of God. And unlike the angels, who, who, as it were, can't suffer from the frailties of the flesh, we do suffer from the frailties of the flesh. And that is going to be of a benefit to us in the kingdom age. Then we'll be like the Lord Jesus Christ. We will no more be flesh. But just in the same way as he was touched by our infirmities, 
to make him a, a, a suitable mediator and intercessor. So we are touched by the infirmities of the flesh so that, so that when we talk to the, to the populations of the world, when they have been enduring suffering and difficulty, we will be able to have an empathy with them. We'll be able to say, well, yes, well, that sort of thing happened to me. God's purpose is that as we are led by the Lord Jesus Christ, then we will lead those who are in the world to the things of God. But uh, let's just go back to um, Exodus chapter 14 to, 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 to think a little bit more uh, about this angel that, uh, that God talked about um, in chapter 23. So chapter 14 of, of Exodus, we know these, uh, we know these uh, um, events well. In verse 19, the angel of God went before the camp of Israel. So, so the angel of God is going in front of the people. He's leading them. Now he does something different. He removes and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood between, behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to the Egyptians, but it gave light unto the nation of Israel, so that the one came not near to the other all the night. So here we see the dual purpose of the angels. In one sense, they've been leading the nation of Israel. Now they've gone behind to thwart those that would destroy the people of God. But the angelic presence is in this cloud. And this cloud, with, I would say, that same angelic presence, continues with the children of Israel all through the wilderness journey. In actual fact, if we come to uh, Numbers and chapter... Um, well, actually, let's go to... Before we go to Numbers, let's just go to Exodus chapter 40. Now keep your fingers moving this evening. Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And, the, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode therein. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, it's talking about the glory of God, but this is the angelic presence that's in this cloud... And now, it's not in front of or behind the column of the nation of Israel. It's in the very centre of the camp. And it's there for them. And actually, it is used, isn't it, to indicate when they need to move. So, just come with me now to Numbers chapter 9. Actually, before you get to Numbers chapter 9. Now, let's just, um, well, let's just go to verse 15 in Numbers chapter 9, see as we've got there. On the day that the tabernacle was reared up, and the cloud, up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony, and at even, the, at even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire unto the morning. So it was all way. The cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed in the place where the cloud abode. There and the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days... Then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. So you can see the, the overall direction of the lives of the children of Israel was influenced by this angel of God's presence. So, so when it was time to move on, they moved on. When it was time to stay, they stayed. But they had a role as well, didn't they? When it was there, and when it was over the tabernacle in the very centre of the camp, then, what did they have to do? They had to keep the charge of the Lord. 
So the overall framework of their lives was influenced divinely. Where they went, what they did, where they went in terms of geography, where, in, 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 the, in, in the wilderness. The, the macro, as it were, was influenced by the angel of God. But they had a responsibility that within that framework, they had to always do what God wanted. They had to minister um, or keep the charge of the Lord. There were things to be done in the truth. Yes, your life might mean that you are, ta you are taken uh, under the direction of God to various places. There might be that the angels work in your lives to cause certain things to take place so that you end up at rugby and not Coventry or Coventry and not rugby or, or whatever. But within that, we have a responsibility to carry on doing the things of God. In fact, we will flick back to Numbers chapter 1 because they're told in Numbers chapter 1 the importance of uh, being uh, diligent in the things of God. Numbers chapter 1 and verse uh, 52, the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp and every man by his own standard throughout their host. So there was a, right, there was a set place uh, around the camp. But the Levites, ah, the Levites, they're the priests, aren't they? What are we called to be? We're called to be a kingdom of priests. So, so the, the role of the Levites is something that is particularly pertinent to us. What does the Levites have to do? The Levites shall pitch around the tabernacle of the testimony, and there shall be no, that there shall be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep the charge, again, same phrase, of the tabernacle of the testimony. So this tabernacle is in the very centre of the nation. The cloud with the angelic presence is upon it. And who is close by? It is the Levites. And so I think that is a great uh, picture of the role of the angels in our lives and our responsibility towards that. The things of God are where the angels are. And our responsibility is to come close to the things of God. So when we think about angelic presence in our lives... If we're wandering off and doing what we, what, we, you know, what we want to do, then we mustn't necessarily expect that angel, angelic presence to be there. Maybe it will, to, to put some stumbling blocks, to, to maybe try and make us come back. But if we go off, we cannot expect to have that, that overshadowing uh, work of the angels in our lives. And that's something for us to think about sometimes, isn't it? When we get up to things that we shouldn't. We can't expect God to be there thinking about us and looking after us if we are not doing that which is most important, which is following after him. So having thought about those overarching principles, let's just look at some practical examples. Let's go to the New Testament for a moment and look at the... Uh, uh, the Lord Jesus. Matthew chapter 4 has the, uh, the account of the temptation in the wilderness. And there are two instances with angels within this, this section. We're going to um, look at the second one first. The second uh, incident is in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 4. So when the devil leaves him, so the test is over, behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. So what do we think might be happening there? Why have the angels come to minister him? Well, we know that the Lord Jesus has been for a long period of time now in the wilderness, and he would be weak Exhausted mentally, perhaps, and physically. But he's been doing God's work, hasn't he? And so the angels are there, ministering to him, strengthening him, helping him in his desire to do that which is right in God's sight. 
So there they get the, the, the angels as ministers there to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has centred his mind on doing what God wants him to do. But that's not the, the only time angels are mentioned, do they, in this section. We remember that in verse 5, the devil taketh him into the holy city and is setting, it, setting him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up lest at any time thou should dash thy foot against a stone. And scripture is being quoted, isn't it? We're going to go back to Psalm 91 in a moment. But what does the Lord Jesus say? He doesn't say, yeah, well, that's fine, I'll jump off because I'll be fulfilling prophecy then. What does he say? He says... Uh, thou shalt... Uh, um, all these things I will give thee if thou shalt worship me verse, uh, Jesus, verse 10 and then saith Jesus unto him get thee hence Satan for it is written thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shall he, thou serve no sorry I've missed it it's verse 7 isn't it it is written again thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God so, so Jesus' answer is this isn't about me it isn't saying, oh yeah, the angels are looking after me, I could do what I want. It's about God and manifesting God's character in our lives. So the angels were there to be with the Lord Jesus, but they were there to help him in his work of fulfilling God's purpose. And so sometimes, you know, and people think, well, I can do what I want because the angels will be with me. It doesn't matter if I wear my seatbelt. It doesn't matter if I, if I do this or do that because, well, the angels will be with me. The Lord Jesus says, you shall not test the trant the Lord thy God. That's not the purpose of the angels. The purpose of the angels are to bring those that are his to God's kingdom. So let's go back to Psalm 91 because that is the verses that are being quoted here. And although Jesus says, oh, I'm not going to tempt God, it doesn't mean that these verses are, are untrue. So Psalm 91 is a, a most lovely psalm. We haven't got time to, to, to spend too much time in it. But verse 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he will deliver thee from the snare and the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. And he shall cover thee with his feathers. And under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. And thou shalt not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Here is the believer facing challenges and difficulties. But where does he dwell? Does he just flee to God when things get tough? Ah, oh, I remember about God. Oh yes, perhaps if I worship him, he'll be with me now. No. He dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's his permanent residence. God isn't somewhere that we can just go to when, when things are tough in our lives. He's not like the St. Christopher around our neck that we can say, oh, tough, things are tough, you know, I'll, I'll perhaps think about him now. The worship of God is something that we do day in and day out. We make him our refuge and we abide under his shadow. And then 
And only then do we have the comfort of these, these words that are spoken. Now, those words that are um, talked of when he talks about dwelling under the shadow of the wings are actually used a number of times in the scripture of a number of different people. And we are going to look at some of them in a little while. But before we do that, let's just go back to um, the New Testament. We're going to go via that reading that we read in Ezekiel chapter 9. So what has been talked about here in Ezekiel chapter 9? Again, it is about God's care for those that are his. In Ezekiel chapter 9, God is bringing judgments upon the nation of Israel because of their, their lack of worship of him and their idolatrous worship. And yet there are those within this community that are his, who are vexed by the things that they see. And what's God going to do in those circumstances? Well, Abraham had a similar discussion, didn't he, with the angel of God. What if there are just a few in the city of Sodom? Will you destroy all of Sodom just because, um, and destroy them because of the wickedness of the majority? We know what happened in Sodom, that the angels went and, and they took out Lot, didn't they, before the destruction. And here it is again, God's care for those that are his, that the angel with the ink horn goes round and he marks in the forehead those that are his. It's interesting, isn't it, that when we come to Revelation, there is another class of people who have a mark in their forehead. So our life is about a choice, isn't it? Are we going to follow the things of the world? We have that mark in our forehead? Or are we going to think of the things of God and have that mark in our forehead? We have a great comfort, don't we? We know that the God's judgments will come upon this earth. And we're not sure exactly how much of that we will see before we are taken to meet our Lord. But we have a great comfort that, that God is there looking after and concerned for those who are his. So with that in mind, let's go back to the New Testament and back to Acts and think about Peter. Because Peter perhaps, uh, gives us a, a little bit more um, uh, of a picture of, of what the angels are doing and, and, and what our response to it should be. Now this passage is notable, isn't it, that uh, there seemed to be an understanding that each person had a personal angel. Remember that uh, when Peter arrives at the door, they, they think it must be uh, the angel of Peter. They don't believe that their prayers have been answered and Peter has been released. So it certainly does seem to be a, 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 an, under, an understanding amongst the first century community that, that, that God had almost appointed individual angels to individual people may be an angel shared by a number of individuals. But that's certainly what is being um, thought of here, isn't it? But that's not really what I want to, to focus on in this passage. We know that Peter's life was in danger. He was in prison. We know that by this point, Stephen has already died. He has been martyred. So we will think about in a few minutes things that are not so good that happen to, to the followers of, Jesus, of God. But here is Peter, and he is in the prison, isn't he? In verse 6, Herod would have brought him forth the same night. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came in upon him, and a light shined in the prison... And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. Now what is remarkable about that passage? 
I think the remarkable thing is Peter is fast asleep. Peter is taking rest and seems to be, as it were, relaxed in the situation that he is in. He is facing the possibility of death. We know what happened to Stephen. The believers are there praying. But Peter himself seems remarkably calm, doesn't he? Not only is he asleep, but when the angel comes, the angel comes and shines a light and then has to give him a good nudge to wake him up. So how is it that Peter is so relaxed in this situation? And I would put it to you that the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ have, have had a, a, a remarkable change in Peter. He is now accepting the will of God. Whatever that might be. I mean, Apostle Paul talks about this. You know, it didn't matter to Peter whether he glorified God by preaching and was alive or whether he glorified God by, by standing firm for the things that he believed in and being martyred by the authorities. It didn't matter to him because both were glorifying God. Now, speaking personally, I don't think I could have slept soundly in that situation. And the flesh takes over. But I guess we take great comfort, don't we, by the journey that Peter had been on. You know, he had denied his Lord because the flesh took over then. He wasn't strong enough in that situation. But now... His understanding of God's plan and purpose was enough that, that he could sleep in these circumstances, even though, potentially, humanly speaking, bad things could happen to him and he could lose his life. And that, I think, is, is the great um, lesson that we have to learn when we think about the angels in our lives. The comfort is they are there through good or through bad. Naturally speaking, we want them to be there, making things, everything right for us. That, that, that we sort of, as it were, tread paths that are easy, untroubled by anything. But that won't develop us, that we might be useful to God in, in, in the kingdom. But the disciple... aims to be able to be in a state where it doesn't matter whether good or bad happens they know their life is in God's hands they are in the hands of the almighty God and they are then accepting of his will whatever it may be I want to come back now to 2nd of Samuel 22 we're going to find those shattering wings again that uh, we read together in that psalm. In the context of Second Samuel 22 is, uh, is at the end of chapter 21, verse 15 of chapter 21. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. And Ishbi Benob, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. Now, this man's a giant, and he's probably pretty used to killing people. And I put it to you that he probably wouldn't normally be deceived whether somebody was alive or dead. So whatever suffering David had had at his hands, I put it to you that David was pretty much dead. As far as Ishbob, Ishbob, 
whatever his name was, was <laughs> concerned, you know, this man was dead. And that, humanly speaking, how would we react? It says, doesn't it, that uh, David waxed faint. His strength seemed to have departed from him. What would our reaction be? If we'd just been basically beaten up by a giant, what would we say? Where was God? When I needed him most, where was God? That's not what David says at all, is it? He pens this psalm. Verse 1 of chapter 22. David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my saviour. Thou hast saved me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. We could be cynical and say, well, David survived, so yes, perhaps he would be, be grateful. He, he was alive when maybe he should have been dead. But I think that misunderstands the point. For David, God was with him through the traumas of, of this battle here and all the battles that David fought. God Look, David trusted in his God. But it was more than just the here and now, wasn't it? What does he say? He is the horn of my salvation, my refuge, my saviour. David understood that at some point he would die. We are all mortal, aren't we? And this life would be gone. And really it's not about this life, is it? It's about the age to come. And David recognises that there is only one who can save. There is only one that can give life out of death. And that is the almighty God. And so he trusts in the one whose wings overshadow those that are his. And so he talks, isn't he, in verse 3, the the one in whom I trust, it is the one that is, one flees to for protection. It's that that word that we had in the psalm that we we look together. And most famously, it is words that are used of Ruth, David's um, great grandma. Ruth chapter 2, and verse 12. Boaz speaking to Ruth. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given to thee of the Lord God of Israel, and of whose wings. Thou art come to trust. Now both these characters, in fact all three characters that are, that, that are within uh, this, uh, this book of Ruth, Naomi, Ruth and Boaz, I would put to you have all had their fair share of difficulty and tragedy. Boaz, we sense, is an older man. We wonder where the wife of his youth was. We would speculate that she had died and he was left a widow. The sadness in his life. Ruth, who has found the truth in Naomi and in, in her family, but has been left a widow, has now had to leave her native land and is in this land of promise, but it's not an easy land. There's plenty of bigotry and suspicion of this Moabitish woman. And what of Naomi? 
And when she comes back, she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. And yet in all these individuals, those difficulties in circumstances have actually driven them not away from God, but closer to God. And sometimes, brethren and sisters, difficult things will happen in our lives. There will be challenges. There will be tragedies. And the challenge for us is, is that going to bring us closer to our God? Or is that going to drive us away? There are only two outcomes, aren't there? The truly faithful, even in the difficulties and the challenges, will come closer to God. Because they understand that it's not about them. It's not about us. It's not about what we want. It is the humble acceptation of the will of God. So our time has gone. Let's just go back to the New Testament. I was going to go to Paul, uh, because Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh, doesn't he? And he says... Um, you know, that uh, it was uh, there as a difficulty, but he says, um, I, I pray three times to, to God that a thorn in my flesh might be removed. But he said, that wasn't God's will. He says, God says that uh, my grace is made strong or my grace, grace is manifested in weakness. And so Paul accepts the thorn in his flesh. I think it's a good practical lesson. Three times he asks and then he accepts. It's enough to feel that we've made our petition and it's enough for us to feel that God has answered even if it's not the answer that humanly speaking we would have liked. But I want to finish in Luke 22. Because in Luke 22 we see the ultimate challenge of a man to lay down his life for his friends. And in Luke 22, the Lord Jesus asks God, doesn't he, to take away this cup. And we have the angels involved, those that camp around, those that love him. The Lord Jesus had made his refuge in his, his father. In him he trusted in all his life. And here they are in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus now... I would say understands, but he always understood what was going to be for him. But now, the reality of what is being asked him is suddenly confronting him. He recognises the pain and the suffering that is about to befall him. And who could could willingly allow themselves to suffer like that. And so in verse 39, he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine be done. You see, here is the ultimate acceptation of the will of God. Of putting away the flesh. And when bad things happen, humanly speaking, to those that follow the Almighty God, 
we sometimes ask ourselves, where were the angels? Well, here we're told, aren't we? In verse 43, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven. Well, don't the angels always dwell in heaven? It's come straight from God. It's come straight from the Father to give a message to his son, to strengthen him, that he might endure the pain, that he might understand that, yes, it's God's will that must be done. So when we ask ourselves, where are the angels when bad things happen to us? The answer, brethren and sisters, is they are close by. God is as concerned about his, his followers when times are difficult as he is when times are good. The angel of the Lord encamps around those that love him and they will never, ever leave those that trust in almighty God. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.